Perfect, great. Okay, so I'm thrilled to be here today, this late for me, very strange to talk, almost sleep bedtime, but still very exciting. So thank you for having me here, great opportunity. And I would like to share with you today why I believe we should care about ethics in data science. For myself, I'm a senior data science engineer in Swiss Data Science Center, and I describe myself as a data scientist with a strong passion for artificial neuroscience. And I will let you know in my talk what exactly I mean by that. Throughout this talk, I will approach data science as a discipline to deliver insights and solutions to problems that uses different techniques such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, or deep learning. According to Capgemini Research Institute report, 66% of customers expect the, the products based on data science to be fair and free from bias. And that's a lot. This expectation is based that we know as humans, we are subject to prejudice, we have opinions, we may be subject to emotions, we may act from our intuition, from gut feeling, and we expect that solution delivered by data science will be based on math, so it will be objective and impartial. Unfortunately, humans are involved all the way in the creation of data science products, so all their biases get into those products and what is worse, they get even amplified. The there are multiple sources of bias and here I'm grouping these sources to three broad categories. The first one is data bias. It appears as early as a data collection phase. So the collected data may reflect some historical societal bias, bias decisions. It may also be imbalanced for certain classes. And as you have noticed, for example, Pavel was checking for that. So it's a very good example of how these checks should be done. So what are uh, the classes represented in my data? How can it affect the results of my modeling and so on? And also the data preparation, the features that we generate may not be fit for the purpose of modeling individual fairness outcomes and similarly for the measurement of data. It may not be, for example, at the right granularity. Another type of bias is related to design. It starts already with problem definition. So when we develop a data science solution, we usually have a business problem at hand. And very challenging and complicated task is to translate this business problem into data science problem. And this translation frequently is, is not that easy. And bias may arise at that stage. Not only we may actually optimize for something that business doesn't need, but we may also develop a solution that will be biased. It is also very hard to assess downstream impact of, of the delivered solution. So we can project to certain outcomes, but we can go only as far as our imagination can go. There are also multiple mathematical definition of fairness. So if you were to optimize for fairness in addition to model accuracy, we would need to choose the right definition and be sure that we can actually integrate it with our model and metrics. Frequently, there is also lack of social context. For example, if data science team con consists of individuals with similar backgrounds and similar views, it will be hard for these people to imagine what is a social context for someone who has a very different background. And finally, the processes are frequently imperfect in the organization. So the proper bias reviews cannot be done and the risks from bias are not properly communicated. The final bucket is cognitive bias. So this is the bias that appears in people who are involved in the creation of data science solution, but also in the users of data science solution. And at every, every time we have people involved, they may be subject to cognitive bias that will affect the use of data science solution or the development of the solution. For example, the confirmation bias is when we will tend to see in the data, the confirmation to our prior beliefs, so it will already believe true, although it's not necessarily the case. The overconfidence bias can, can be misleading because it, it, may, it may lead to people insisting on certain approaches or strategies to develop a product which may be erroneous and not, and, and not taken with precaution. 
the framing effect in diagnostic context, it is something when you have subtle cues that may affect the diagnostic decision. And the anchoring effect is when the initial diagnostic decision is the one believed to be the most correct one, although the subsequent information might be the contrary. Huh? Yeah. So the problem with the bias is that algorithmic bias causes harm. And not only causes harm, but this bias gets also amplified and there is a problem of assigning accountability. Who is actually responsible if an algorithm causes harm to someone? I would get, like to give a couple of examples of harm from algorithmic bias. One example is coming from UK. In the beginning of COVID pandemic, there was a confinement during which the A-level exams were canceled because of COVID. And these A-level exams are the exams that determine to which university a student can apply. So they are very important. What UK officials did, they asked teachers to grade students based on their performance for the first half of the year. So teachers did that, and as they are humans, they tended to overrate the students. So students ended up with much higher grades and the historical grade distribution was strongly skewed to more positive outcomes. The problem arises from the fact that in UK, there is a regulation that allows only 5% increase in the number of places in universities compared to the previous year. And with teachers grade, this difference was higher than 5%. So what UK officials did, they mandated Ofqual to create a, an algorithm correcting these grades and addressing this issue. So Ofqual analyzed what happened with teacher grading. They looked whether teachers could actually correctly grade students, and it turned out they could assign correct grades only half of the time, but they were very good at ranking the students. So what they did, they took the historical distribution of, of each educational center, and then they adjusted this distribution and overlaid it with the rank produced by teachers to generate the new grades. And there was a lot of there were a lot of reasons to believe that this will be a success because UK alone accounts for more than 50% of global ethical principles. They have 13 guidelines, and Ofqual followed what was preconcised in those ethical principles. So they released 30, 30, 319 page report, which covered methodology in a big detail and all the bias assessments. Unfortunately, the grades were not fair and it, they tended to penalize students from poorer non-white communities. So students went out with protests. What happened there is that there is a data bias. So historical data, the way it was treated, it would assume that every educational center would perform similarly to previous years. But in some centers, they did some measures to improve perform performance and current year cohort was much better than previous year. But the, the students in this cohort, which was performing better, could only get grades as high as previous year students, which would mean if the worst students were getting fails, the worst students of this year would also have to get, get uh, will also have to fail the exam. And on the other side, there is a problem with design because the fair outcome was considered a st statistically correct distribution of grades, which is not optimal for modeling individual fairness, which then the algorithm didn't deliver. So students were, went out protesting. The good side here is that uh, the cost wasn't really high because the problem was seen and Ofqual had big teams to put on that to try to address the problem, but still there was a big investment and big cost in terms of human investment to sort it all out and to find a solution. Another example is with Apple Card. You probably noticed in 2019, there were a lot of tweets that actually uh, there was a bias towards women that were getting lower credit limits and a lot of people tweeted on that. So essentially, even if women would earn more money and will have better capacity to pay, pay back, she, she may end up getting much lower credit than her husband, for example. 
So we're talking here about data bias, which could be that historically men were given higher credits, but also design bias. When consumers were addressing to Apple, uh, were reaching out to Apple Card and asking for explanation, the algorithm was not transparent and it was not possible to understand how and through which attributes it could derive sensitive information such as gender. Another example you probably also know about, uh, which is about Optum algorithm, which was used in US hospitals. So this algorithm was used to decide which patients uh, should be assigned for extra care. And the assumption was that higher healthcare costs are associated with greater health needs. So the algorithm would risk, uh, would score the patient risk based on total healthcare costs over a year. Unfortunately, the algorithm turned out to be biased and several studies done on that identified that the bias solution, the way the algorithm was done, assigned only 17.7% .7 of, of African-American patients for extra care. And if it would have been unbiased, this number should be 46.5%, which means millions of people were affected by this bias. And the problem is with the data, for example, the similar healthcare costs for an average person do not necessarily contain the same health condition. And in case of African-American patient, the condition will be much worse for everything else same. And there is of course a problem with design, the way the assumption was done and the, the way the model was implemented. And what is interesting, there is also a cognitive bias in hospitals using this algorithm it took a while to realize that there was a problem, meaning that there were probably certain prejudices which matched what was predicted by this algorithm. To illustrate the cognitive bias of the user, I would like to show you this plot. You see the time series variable, so we have target variable of a certain period of time in some unknown units, it's just a mock example, and we generate a forecast based on autoregressive component of target variable and two predictors, predictor one and two. And we show a dashboard to the user where we display variable contributions to the forecast, 20% for autoregressive component, 30% for predictor one, and 50% for predictor two. Natural interpretation would be that, well, predictor two is very important to predict the outcome. Now, if I would complement this dashboard with a comparison for example, to the model, which is purely autoregressive, which only uses target variable itself, historical values to, to do the forecast. And if we would see that there is a very close match in what we forecast, the predictor two does not seem that important anymore. And I would like really to stress here that depending how we show the information and what information we show in the same place and even in, in, which, in which order in that place, will affect the way user will interpret that information. And in case of biomedical applications, it's very, very critical to do the user tests, even for this level to understand, are we inducing any bias? Are we transferring some subtle cues that may lead to erroneous and biased decisions of, of the users of the solution? So humans are biased, algorithms are biased. So what? Algorithms are still faster to solve problems than humans, and they make less errors. And anyway, we do our best. Most people, they want to be fair. Maybe we should just accept it. We live in a biased world. And unless data scientists are some master evil data scientists, they don't want to do harm. And it's not surprising that Gartner predicts that 85% of AA projects will suffer from bias in data or the algorithms or responsible teams by 2022. And these projects will risk substantial costs and also the loss of customer trust. In the past two, three years, as much as 60% of organizations report that they have attracted legal scrutiny, which was related to AI bias. 22% observed customer backlash. So they were really facing the loss of their customers. And the customer cost is high. It is already complicated to have adoption, the customer adoption of AA solutions. 
And once we achieve that, we want to keep our customers. And if our solution turns out to be biased, it, it, it risks to cost us a lot. So 44% of customers would tell their friends and family about the issue and will urge them to not interact with the AI company. 39% raise concerns with the company and demand an explanation of a solution, which can again cost in the effort. It's not always easy to do this explanation. It requires resources, FTEs. We need to have people who will address those problems and we can imagine that if there are thousands or tens of thousands and even more people coming and asking, and we need to address all of that, it's, it's a lot of effort and it's a big cost. And also 39% would move from AI-enabled channel to the human channel when they would interact with their organization and we risk our adoption. We risk the trust of the customers here. The good side of the story is if Pains can be big. We can, we can incur big costs if our AI solution, data science solution is biased, but the gains can also be big. So if we don't do any action, of course, we will risk to incur pains, to incur costs, which are related to bias solution delivery. But if we address bias proactively, if we think about it, if we do an effort, we will be able to react fast in case this bias appears, mitigate bias risks, and we will be also capable to have some gains from it. A nice illustration of that is an econometric study which found that less bias in talent allocation could explain from 20 to 40% of GDP growth in US between 1960 and 2010. So how to address the bias? If we look at existing global ethical principles, here it's a study from 84 guidelines. They converge across a lot of dimensions such as transparency, justice and fairness, responsibility, freedom and autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, trust. And the question is how do we put these ethical principles into practice? And I would really like to stress at the how part. So it's about how to implement and not what. Almost any ethical guideline will say that we should ask for consent before collecting the data. But then if we, if we have a small scale study, maybe it's easy, but if it's a big scale study, it's something very complicated because we need to get first some data to show that we are trustworthy, but we cannot show that we're trustworthy because we cannot collect the data. So it's a vicious circle. On the other hand, if we shouldn't collect any sensitive attributes, such as demographic attributes or genetic data, how then can we check if the solution that we deliver is not biased? We no longer have those dimensions. And if we as humans are not very good at figuring that out, algorithms are extremely good at figuring out the dimensions, the demographic and privacy sensitive dimensions from the data which was deprived of those attributes. I will give you an example about how we could address some of these issues using Renko, which is a platform for knowledge infrastructure for research lifecycle developed at Swiss Data Science Center. So this infrastructure is based on the knowledge graph, which is at the heart of the system. You see it here in the middle and connects all the other components. It's useful already at the planning stage when we start the project, we want to see what was already done. Can we leverage any of existing work? Can we check which exploratory avenues are more advantageous with which data types? Then at preparation, when we fetch our data, the data is, versioned, uh, is st stored in version data containers. Data exploration stage is greatly fac facilitated with interactive computing. Modeling phase is, is done with automatic provenance tracking to guarantee full reproducibility. The validation phase is facilitated with version code and containerized environments and the reuse of our product will be easier because Renko invests reusable workflow solutions as part of its platform. So I would like to show you how we can address ethical dimensions through, the through five ethical dimensions outlined on this slide. Transparency, 
auditability, reproducibility, interpretability and explainability, and finally fairness. So all these dimensions are critical to deliver, deliver ethically robust data science solutions. One way to address auditability is through continuous compliance and self-assessment. And as I mentioned, the heart of the rank was the knowledge graph, but another big component is GitLab CI-CD. So if we couple the two, we can set up continuous evaluation of analytical workloads against standards. And we currently develop it in collaborations with actors of healthcare sector, with hospitals, with um, sequencing platforms, and with private partners. And the idea there is that we can uh, guarantee continuous accreditation readiness for exploratory solutions, which are about clinical interpretation of results. And this is really something that if you implement it early enough, then Knowledge Graph picks up, picks up every case and puts it in the right bucket, reports on it and flags if there is a problem. So we can really move, up, move, move away from this uh, paperwork required for the audit and focus on interesting parts and let Ren could do it for you. Another part is about reproducibility. And here I would like to stress that Renku does automatic workflow generation from user in input. So what is important for reproducibility and what is state of the art now is, is are these findable, reusable, reproducible workflows, which are written with workflow languages, CWL or WIDL. So this is a new standard. Now, frequently this uh, workflow development requires a specialist that masters the workflow language to write it up. So what we try to do at Renko, we try to lower the barrier and really make it as easy as recording user commands and encoding it as a workflow so that user, in this case, uh, a person, for example, developing a biomedical application can focus on the problem at hand, can focus on how to solve medical problem rather than how to write a workflow. And all these elements are packaged with version components, so version data, version code, and version environment with rich metadata on Knowledge Graph. The next element, interpretability and explainability. So it's really important to support human interpretation and oversight to facilitate the understanding of interpretable models and of their context. And here we can leverage the knowledge graph on Renku, which can bring the context by connecting to different ontologies in different domains, across domains as well, and across different projects. We also need to enable the understanding of black box models, explain with examples based methods, test really what are the limits of the model, how much do we need to change inputs to change the outputs? What are the classes that are not well modeled and escaping from our model? And also, of course, visualize model behavior on subsets of input data, including its performance on a range of fairness metrics. And again, here, Renko can help with interactivity, with versioning models, connecting models to the ontologies, collecting models across different projects and repositories and building knowledge from that. Fairness, so embedding fairness metrics in models. We can anonymize subsets of data that vary for a range of attributes. So if we cannot have those attributes ourselves, let's say we receive data from hospital, they have the data on their patients. So we could ask, for example, them to prepare these anonymized subsets with the idea that we will have maybe representative subsets, subset that is skewed for certain attributes and that contains overrepresented minority groups, and then we could include them as our model validation and model lifecycle monitoring that upon refresh, model would automatically apply, uh, uh, would be automatically applied to each data subset. And then we would just look at the differences in accuracy metrics and email or flag it somehow if there is a threshold that is reached and this difference is too high. So here we're talking about continuous model monitoring and this would relate again to the components of GitLab CI coupled to the knowledge graph. So finally, the transparency. 
And here I'm talking about linked data and connecting the dots on the knowledge graph. So knowledge graph links all the components, data, environment, workflows, ontologies, models. The way we sometimes use it now in collaboration with hospitals is, for example, to give transparency to patients that choose to donate their samples to the hospital. And in this case, patients really seek to understand what happens to their data, but we cannot really tell them that their exact sample was used for that and that. But what we can do, we can have high level knowledge graph attribute extraction and we can show generally over all tissue samples, for example, by tissue type, which projects they are used in, what's coming out of these projects, how long these projects were lasting, did these projects have any outcomes. And this kind of transparency is extremely rewarding and continues the cycle, building up the cycle of trust between the clients, in this case, patients of the hospital and the provider of the hospital itself. So now I'm coming back to what I said in the beginning, the emerging role of artificial neurologists. And what I mean here is really treating AI models as patients. So being like a doctor to AI model. So we can listen to data symptoms. We can listen to method symptoms. We would have regular checkups for bias. And of course, promote prevention and awareness through all the chain of people involved in the creation of data science solutions. We can also extend it to persuasive storytelling to address the cognitive biases in communication, for example, with stakeholders or with team members to avoid the pitfalls of design and data biases. And an example of this could be communicating the risks associated with the bias and how we can mitigate them and include important steps early enough in the process, such as the need to involve real end users early and regularly to collect their feedback. And here I would really like to stress the real users. Frequently in projects, uh, there is a sentiment that we know what users need and then the development goes on without really onboarding users. And then it could be too late. Or if it's a business solution, Sometimes it, it, it can happen that only a manager of people who would actually use the product will be consulted. And again, it's a big risk of delivering something biased and not useful. Or convincing to use fairness metrics along with model accuracy early enough. If we do it early, it comes at smaller cost than integrating something like that at a later stage. And finally, establishing bias reviews and automatic continuous self-assessment again, there is a bigger effort in the beginning, especially for the ones who would put it in place. But once it's done, everybody in the organization can benefit from it. And it a lot of things come at less big cost or very small cost. We can also learn from other industries such as finance or pharma or aerospace and use some of their quality practices on data science. For example, checklists for data science. So, these checklists could be developed internally by an organization or shared in the community to answer questions such as if we have studied and understood what could be the bias sources in the data, and if we check, check for that, if we tested our data to ensure that it's representative and that it's fair. Also assessing the team if diversity of opinions is represented and, yeah. yes, yes. Sorry, that was a mistake. Continue. Okay. No, no problem. <laughs> okay. And uh, finally, to see if we test and monitor a model for drift to ensure that it remains not only accurate, but also fair over time. Another example is failure mode and effect analysis. So on X axis, we have failure probability, which is a probability of bias, low or high. And on y-axis, there is harm to society from low to high. So if we end up in top right corner, we can try lowering the bias to see if it also lowers harm to society to end up in this nice bottom left corner. 
Now, if the bias is low, but harm to society is high, maybe it's not worth to deliver this kind of use cases. And I saw once an example presented in a conference with big pride. Uh, it was a Facebook plugin pro provided to the community to deduce the marital status and a lot of sensitive attributes of Facebook users, which probably wasn't very biased, but was very harmful if people do not want to share these kind of attributes with the community. And finally, the bottom right corner. So if the harm is, high, uh, is low, but bias is high, we may still consider using this model if that delivers the correct desired outcomes and desired results. And the last example is quality by design, where we would define desired product performance and streamline to specifications of product design, and then specifications of process design, all the way through process performance to control the process. And it's a continuous cycle to maintain the quality of data science product delivery. As Stephen Hawking said, AI will be either the best or the worst thing ever to happen to humanity. And I suggest that let's make it the best thing together by co-creating, by sharing our failures and our best practices, and by leveraging the latest innovations in ethical data science. And thank you. That's it for my part. Thank you for listening. I am open for questions. Thank you. You're great. There are questions in Q and A part, but it's uh, questions targeting all of you. You may just read it through them. From maybe we start from questions to Oksana directly, and we can move later on to some questions which were told to me. I think these are questions to you. Only to me. Only and, to and maybe to Honor as well. Yes, and Honor, I think. I haven't seen it. Uh, so honor. So maybe just going back to the very beginning. Tensorflow uh, light or something similar to perform. So one of the question was quite technical. So here, for example, whether what type kind of TensorFlow. So there are different flavors of TensorFlow you can use. So it's uh, TensorFlow, it's a package which is uh, being used to do deep, uh, deep learning with artificial neural networks. And yes, there is a TensorFlow Lite which is designed to work on cell phones. And one of the, uh, one of the questions which I'm trying to answer with Honor is whether we should work on edge or on a cloud. So whether we, exactly, uh, whether we should deploy it on a phone uh, itself and then analyze some data with some simple, rather simple mo models, or whether we should do analysis on cloud because maybe we would like to do it, but there are some legal issues with sharing this data uh, without, for example, permission of, of, uh, of a user, which would be a problematic. So we are more into 10, into edge solution, but also TensorFlow Lite, uh, if you're already working in a TensorFlow environment, it would not be so difficult to go to other TensorFlow uh, versions. This is what, ex at least this is what I heard from TensorFlow people because we have them in Zurich and I spoke with some of them. Uh, so we shouldn't have much problems. Uh, they also do meetings uh, once a year in November and I highly, uh, encourage you to attend these meetings and contact with me if you would like to have more information. So there's going to be more about TensorFlow. Um, how did you perform the research to find the medical data set? So this is a very interesting question. So uh, I, I started from Kaggle. So Kaggle is a um, big, uh, uh, big repository of data. It's basically a company in the, in San Francisco, I think in San Francisco, but uh, generally in California, where you can find, like, go for competing with other people using machine learning to, for example, provide the best, the most optimized uh, algorithms that solve some kind of problems. And 
you can gain uh, some price for a most accurate or more sensitive model you're gonna to generate. There are some rules of doing it. And this is where you can really find, uh, if not exactly the data set, but also you can find some data uh, produced by someone. And after this, you can just add, start asking questions. So very often with this kind of data, the people try to go to um, Kaggle and post it. There are similar services in other countries. There's similar service in Switzerland. Uh, I don't remember their name. I think it was Data Ninja, Data, data Samurai, something like that. Uh, from Geneva, do you remember? Um, Samurai? No, no, it's a, a company, but uh, they were on our meeting, meetup, but there's also a company like Kaggle, but in Switzerland, they also provide this data sets, so you can use it. The, the, the only problem is how the data are being licensed. This is very important to, to notice it. You can also search PubMed, which is a um, publications, uh, medical publications uh, on NCBI. And uh, you can go there and type it. This is a US service. The similar is, I think, if you go to ABI, ABI in Europe, but NCBI is basically the best to, 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 really, um, and to really search for something. And this is a big source of data. Uh, you can also ask specialists. This is the best way uh, because they are up to the date with most of things. Um, So next question from Edward uh, Kukla is uh, in terms of overall efficiency, can the receiver operating have to still, mm, um, uh, So uh, if you can basically, so Edward, if I am not mistaken, he's asking if we can retrain the models uh, to, to, for example, become more efficient? Yes, this is a very good question. This is basically why I'm building a system, not uh, some, some scripts, uh, because we really need to productize it. We need to evaluate more data, more data, more data, and then again, uh, train the model and retrain. And very often in a large uh, corporations, large services, this is happening at night. So, uh, okay, it, it depends where you are, but it happens at night that your model is being updated when it's redeployed. And this is something that is very good if you are working on the cloud. And you can do this on the cloud, on edge. So having these models on a device would be much more problematic. Uh, Edward Kuka also asked about uh, financial optimization. Uh, minimize, uh, but he, he is agreeing with the premise of minimizing the costs. I have to here say it's minimizing the costs for hospitals and insurance companies, which I hope they will like and support us financially. And uh, okay, is there a measure of ROI that includes patient outcomes, medical and financial? Ah, so he is furthermore in, in his question asking whether um, there are some uh, ROI return of investment uh, measurements that includes patient outcomes, medical and financial, uh, to perhaps minimize the negative effects of uh, profit motive in some companies which tend to maximize the profit. So in this case, I would say we didn't really take it from this angle, uh, from our angle, whenever we see it, whenever we spoke with the doctors is um, is that if you early detect something early, you don't need so much chemotherapy, you don't need so much uh, uh, skin removal, you don't need so much treatment and observation. Also part of the treatment, which is done by medical experts is done by you. So there's only the cost savings. The only cost increase, which we would have to combat with, and this is really a problem of this balance trade-off between sensitivity and specificity of the model is uh, when you, for example, send your patients more often to specialists for the visit. So we would have to prove to, for example, insurance company, that although more often they're coming to specialists, they are spending less time uh, with specialists because there is, for example, more efficient work. So this is something what is uh, basically the same, detecting pneumonia or detecting other things. And you can, for example, argue that 
Uh, there are some methods of detecting pneumonia not using X-rays, but uh, just by using microphones, and you can check it and you just use the sensor to detect also COVID. But specific sounds and uh, during the breathing uh, are emitted when you are having a pneumonia because it changes. It's not super reliable, but it's reliable to some certain percent, and it's cheap and uh, to deploy. But it also provides a lot of false positives. So whether there's a Trade-off, it really depends. And how you argument it, it's like basically your sales pipeline. <laughs> I, got, I, got two, I got two comments yeah. on this. First, uh, uh, yeah, it's the, um, uh, there was a speech from uh, Kudelski uh, a couple of years ago in, in Swiss Tech Convention Center. He mm -hmm. said, yeah, the entrepreneurship uh, idea is really different. In uh, in U.S. versus Switzerland, in, yeah. and it really depends on it has some correlation with nature. In Switzerland, everything is stable, the, the mountains, the views, forest, everything is, you know, beautiful and safe, and you don't want to break it. So people focus on on, on uh, cost avoidance uh, as as their prime uh, factor. But uh, but in U.S., you you have to be adventurous. You have to go. Go ahead. You have to risk yourself. So, so you're, you're maybe perhaps because of that you're inspired to uh, maximize your profit. The uh, the in relation to that, uh, uh, it okay. might be inter interesting to study uh, uh, economics because they have this term called negative externalities, uh, like uh, like me smoking. Okay, I'm not a smoker, but I, I'm smoking. It gives me some pleasure, mm -hmm. but it has a negative externality. On people around me because they they become passive smokers themselves so uh so i would say there would be like uh, alpha times the the, the profit plus uh, one minus alpha times the negative x you know, some kind of a formula like that could could do could do that but the point would be try would be to try to find uh, the alpha there uh, but uh, to my knowledge uh, uh, i don't know if there's a concrete uh, formulation to that i have to look at um, some mm -hmm. maybe economics literature but it's a bit outside the, uh, the focus of ai but uh, yeah for thought mm -hmm. so uh, a little bit going a bit to gordon um he asked in your email in your example determination on the target cancer is dependent on image uh, processing uh, yes uh, definitely. So uh, this is something what I only had very little time to show during the presentation. Um, there was plenty of different things. We used different statistics, uh, the different pre-processing of the image. Um, I created even a special panel which allows you to, for example, go tap to something what is called TensorFlow Hub, and you could uh, extract already pre-trained uh, convolutional. Uh, 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 convolutional uh, layers of uh, other models to extract the features. So basically to reduce their size and uh, really find out the number of features which are the most um, the most relevant to your uh, to your detection of the cancer. But one of the problem which I had with this pre-trained models, they were not medical. And uh, I was um, uh, even a very simplistic models could beat with simplicity a very sophisticated models trained on millions of pictures of cars, animals, birds, and so on taken because they were just designed for basically for medical purposes. So yeah. So yeah. Uh, Warren actually has a question for Oksana. Ah, oh, uh, so uh, with implicit bias, how can we trust workflow generation in uh, generation in USA? In USA, police data for criminality, if only accepted criminologists are there, are the data set. The community perception is varied from ethnic and racial sets. Does the income and location of people include also factor in income and education? Um, hmm. <laughs> this is something what we typically don't think in Switzerland. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, it's kind of the beauty of this country. Yes, uh, I can take this question, of course. So uh, if, if we know what is the bias, it's actually good because then we can imagine checking for it at, at different stages of development. So the workflow can contain the checkups for bias. And my, my, my main recommendation here would be to include 
these checks as early as already data collection. So if we assess data for bias and we know it's biased and it's biased the way we expected it to be biased, so then we, we are aware of it and we can develop things in a way. So I, I guess it's also very important to uh, raise awareness of people using the algorithm that if, if, if there is a bias, there has to be a very clear message and very clear way of communicating the results so that these, the decisions are done with the awareness of a bias, which, which is a very hard task. There is no perfect solution for that, but we do need community trying and we do need transparency at different steps as much as we can afford it. And I guess in US, there are some examples of, of biased algorithms which would have bad outcomes based on et, 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 ethnicity, right? So there is already some ground, ground there to, to do learnings and to do things better. And I guess for me, transparency would be key. We really need to have solutions where we can see what happens so we can answer and address the problems. And if something happens in feature engineering or something happens later, this has to be understood and we, we can only then address it somehow. So, uh, uh, Gordon also asked me, uh, so thank you, Oksana, but Gordon also asked me, uh, are there other variables, uh, example, chemical that determine the presence of skin cancer that might produce a multivariable data sets that might be a better database for AI uh, machine learning? So, uh, a very good question. Uh, yes, they are, and quite many companies is, uh, are working here on this, and I even know of two in locally which are working, one on using RNA markers in your blood to check for cancer. Uh, they specifically target, I think, co colon cancer, but different uh, type of cancer, even melanoma can be in this epithelial uh, tissues in your colon. And um, uh, you can also, for example, improve your model prediction with age, with sex, with a part of the body where it's being exposed. But it was a very big trade-off. And this is exactly what, what, um, why we conducted the feasibility study, because there was a, um, uh, we didn't know really what kind of data we'd like to use for build, building the model. The goal of feasibility study was not to produce uh, accuracy, which beats another model, then in five days later, someone else beats us another one tenth of percent, and our model is not any good. Now, we really wanted to know whether we exactly need to include this kind of data about some uh, providence of, a, of the images, like where it's, whether it's from a head or leg or, or torso of a person and where this person lives. So we could have some kind of higher probability, for example, with people living in Australia associated, but I didn't use this data on purpose because we didn't want to create a model that, for example, a person from, I don't know, from Idaho will use my, my system and just type, oh, I'm from Australia. And suddenly something what is a skin wall becomes a cancer just because you're in Idaho, because in Idaho, um, I'm, to be honest, I don't know much about Idaho, but, <laughs> but um, probably the skin cancer is not so prominent as in South Australia, uh, where up to two thirds of people, uh, according to recent research, will experience having a skin, some kind of skin cancer, very often non-aggressive, but still a skin cancer. So there are some trade-offs, there are some data which you should use, and there are some additional diagnostics which you can do or not do to, to get the skin cancer. But I don't know about any, any typical chemical or biochemical markers which can determine it. I know that it could be determined by some genomics, uh, sorry, genetics and uh, RNA analysis. Uh, whether it's cost effective, I don't know. But what I know, that for example, if you deploy this kind of tools in sub-Saharan Africa, there will be not many labs which can use it. There will be not many doctors which can interpret the data and not many people who can afford it. But if you deploy a tool which is going to use a smartphone with lower resolution image camera, you will have thousands of them, if not millions.
Great. I guess these are all the questions. You guys are very tired. It's long three hours. It's nice. So we have three three big uh, big uh, talk. So um, so hope that we can have also good uh, good views on the YouTube. So we're gonna release it. Are we gonna edit and release it tomorrow? There. So you're welcome to do that as well in your group. It's, it's a fantastic, uh, I like, I mean, I'm doing AI in health. I, I think this is very rewarding. You guys do, and you're do, doing as a nonprofit. And hopefully this will be a good start. Your product will be a good start of many you guys will do, you know. Uh, thank you for your time, all of you, Oksana, Powell, and Honor. Appreciate all your talk. Um, exciting. Thank you. Thank you for uh, listening, participating. And you guys stay all that hours. Appreciate it. So Bye. really thank you very much for the chance to talk. You're thank welcome. you. Thank you.